so what's up? We haven't, we haven't done one of these in a while, but uh, today is a special one. We have Ryan McKee from Red River Studio. Hello. A solo dev on the Vector 36. You're going to tell us all about that. Uh, yeah, five second pitch. Physics-based <laughs> physics based racer is what it's boiled down to. And you guys are a physics-based brawler, so I think we're a good company. The physics-based crew. We should start a, a physics, physics-based club. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. But it's not just that, it's like uh, skimmers on Mars, and, come on. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, the rest of the game. So it's, uh, you build your skimmers, which are sort of these surface skimming ships, uh, if you can visualize that, and you they're composed of uh, thrusters that propel the ship with the game physics. There's no cheats, there's no sort of pre-programmed motions, you just, um, you build it and and you go. And if you build a ship that um, is poorly engineered, it will reflect that in the gameplay. So it sort of encourages tinkering and um, refining. Where do I look? <laughs> yeah. We just talk to us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no. I'm like that. <laughs> yeah. Just look between the two. Look at the, look at the guitar. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's on Mars. It's being terraformed, and uh, it's just a series of races. Uh, hopefully, with multiplayer. Um, within the next six months, nice. pending on sales. Yeah. yeah. And you've been a solo dev? Yeah, working on it for two years, and uh, I get contractors to pop in every once in a while to help me out uh, with some assets or sound. i got a, a sound guy in Poland who's pretty good, uh, Cubix, K-U-B-I-X, check him out, he's pretty cool. Links in the description. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, God, he'll love that, actually. Uh, give him a plug. Uh, but yeah, I've uh, been a 3D artist since 1999, and I just got into programming, I think probably in 2010, I did an app for um, Android. It was a little like um, health monitor kind of thing. It was a, it was a self, um, self-surveying self um, health monitor in a way. Kind of hard to explain. I'm not going to plug that, but uh, that <laughs> that was a test into just coding to see if I could actually get something in Google Google um, Play Store, and that worked. Uh, and it's pretty cool. So um, I've done various indie projects throughout the years with teams, but then I thought, well, I can do the 3D art. That's not a problem. And Unity's accessible and affordable. Uh, and I really enjoy programming. So just combine the whole mess together, and you get Vector 36. Nice. Ooh. And your engineering background too. Yeah, so I got a degree in mechanical engineering, um, and I've always liked to tinker on stuff. So um, building a race car, I've always been into cars. And I think the first ship you see in the game, um, that hopper, is the inspiration for that. It's basically a space lotus. You know, it's just a tube frame chassis with thrusters, and yeah, it's basically the equivalent on Mars. Yeah. And I just love building stuff. So, you know, that's where the game came from, I think. Nice. Mm-hmm. You've been building the Lotus for five years, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, nobody's counting, but I think it's about six years now. <laughs> it's a work in progress. Awesome. Um, Should show us some pictures of it. I think you showed Alex. Yeah. Did you? Were you were driving? Did you see the photos? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to show you. It's just an open top roadster. It's about this high off the ground. It's in sort of the shape of a coffin. And it's got wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can bury me in it. It's perfect. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just all kind of come together. Uh, I like to think that it's just, you know, when you build these things, it kind of comes from the heart. and it, you, All your cumulative experiences end up popping up in the game when you don't even realize it. Mm. And, like, another thing I was thinking about the other day is I've been ice skating since, uh, since I was, you know, I guess 14 and when you're when you're flying these things you're drifting because it's all in physics and all just kind of drifting around corners and I and sort of the inspiration when you're cruising when you get a good um, sort of flow and rhythm into it it's a little bit like ice skating yeah and you just sort of swoop from one side to the other and it gets quite rhythmic and it's just a very comfortable feeling when you nail it getting to that point is another story but um it's like ice skating but it a thousand kilometers per hour. <laughs> a thousand, yeah. If you yeah. make a mistake, you blow up. You set on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a good, definitely like a good feeling. Like yeah. we ski, oh, we're, we're kind of 
uh, we're discussing going on a ski trip uh, mm. in a month or so. Um, and yeah, that sort of side to side. Mm. I, like I on the motorbike, I sometimes do that when you just get in the you know no cars around in the middle of the night. Just, you can just go. Vroom, just go do the moguls. Yeah, <laughs> but it just feels good. It's a, it's a, I guess a good analogy because obviously to get to that stage requires a little bit of work and practice Skill, yeah. and that's mm. my game, <laughs> you know, that steep learning curve. But once you get to it, it's just cool. You know, it's fun. Yeah. It's relaxing actually. Mm. But how's, how's Christchurch for game development? Well, that's a good question. You guys ask good questions. Um, <laughs> It is, um, I have to really think about that because I work from home and I think no matter where I would be, um, the game would be the same. Um, do you mean kind of like in terms of support? Support and, and like environment, community, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, there's not, okay. Well, there's not much of a game community down there. I think where you guys are right now is the hub for that sort of thing. And so I don't know anybody else in Christchurch that huh. does. Uh, there's a couple groups that do that do games, uh, game development there, uh, but it's not as big as it is here in terms of like that indie scene. And I think being up here is really encouraging for people like me because then you kind of you know talk about ideas and and get inspired to do more things. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it's it's okay. I mean. Christchurch is it's building up, and uh, I don't. Like I guess I work at home, so I don't really like the rebuilds. Don't really affect me. I guess you don't have to commute to work yeah. and deal with traffic cones and and traffic redirection every day. So it doesn't really affect me. So yeah, yeah. Hmm. long winded answer. But. You said you kind of keep yourself isolated. Uh, yeah, um, I guess I. I just have my office and my computer and I'll just work 12, 16 hours a day on it. You know, if I let myself, I have to pull myself away every once in a while to feed the cat and, um, feed myself. Say hello to your partner. Pay attention to my partner (laughs) once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's the hardest part, I guess. Uh, I suppose we're struggling with that a little bit ourselves. The isolation? Well, no more like trying to, stay motivated and work in mm. big chunks of time, like uh, get productivity out of time that we do work on. Mm. Um, yeah, so like interesting ways, like different ways of working. What demotivates you? Like if you're working on something, you're like, I've had enough of this. I don't know. It's not, it's, it's not, nothing is demotivating. I guess it's like, when you're facing the big Goliath of a task and like this, and you see how much there is and it's hard, it's, it's, you know, you can break it down into little pieces and stuff, but it's still really hard to tackle those and chip like start chipping away at it. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's the, that's the hard part. Just getting that start on them. So do you think it's just your scope? It's bigger than you think you can handle. Maybe partly, but like in terms of personal uh, tasks as well and, and things that we got to do. Uh, it's more like there are bigger things looming on the horizon and you're kind of like still sitting and sorting out the smaller stuff that needs to get out of the way. Hmm. Um, so it does, it's, it's like when, I guess when progress doesn't feel like progress right. is when it gets stale. Hmm. Yeah, I can respect that. Um, but you guys all have, see, you know, you're a four man team now, and each of you have, all, you all, it sounds like you all kind of have double tasks because, like, you're sound, but then you're art, and then Danny is um, art and a little bit of programming as well. Yeah. And then you're programming and big yeah. business. <laughs> <laughs> right? Business, yeah. and yeah. we do some community management and like, these videos and stuff. But I think that's really good. The, the point I'm trying to make is that when you have dual roles, it actually keeps things fresh. Like yeah. you can do art yeah. for a little bit and get sick of it and be like, well, I'm gonna tinker with design um, or, you know, like uh, you know, the sound design or whatever. And that's what keeps me going is that because I'm doing everything, 
I'll work on 3D art until I'm totally sick of it and I can't wait to get into the programming. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you're, you're, you, you get fresh eyes on something that you haven't worked on in a while and that's a big, uh, that really helps. I think when you're staring at something for a long time, you're just like, I can't look at this anymore and you don't understand what, you're not progressing. So if you switch it up um, from programming to art to sound design, um, to AI design, you just keep bouncing back and forth whenever you get bored or something, and then you just keep going. That's that's what I do. That works great. Nice. Mm. I love it. Um, that being said, it would be nice to have more people working on stuff. <laughs> the stuff that I don't want to do, I'd, I like to defer that to other people. What's the stuff you don't want to do? Um, <laughs> like, it's, I think uh, it kind of depends. So, like, if we have like the skimmers, which are the complicated vehicles. And I basically build an entire skimmer in about two weeks, I guess. If it's already designed and the concept art's already there, it takes me about two weeks to build all the components, internal, um, externals, internals, the cockpit, all that kind of stuff. And I'll build it in stages. So I'll have the 3D model and that'll be done. And I'll get, that'll get all UV'd. And I'll hit kind of a motivational block because I know at that point I've got to go into ZBrushing. And so then I'll wait and... I kind of wish I'd had someone else to do the 3D model and then just produce it for me, and then I could just do the Z brushing. Uh, kind of break that up into stages. Um, God, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the least enjoyable part? My brain just went like a complete tangent there. Um, and you're looking at like outsourcing your sort of marketing push as well, right? Mm. I don't want to do the marketing per se. I just like developing it, so I'd be happy to get a PR company to, to work on or even even a publisher um, I think they'd be quite good because I think the, the funds are so scalable with that you know you could give a hundred bucks to, to Facebook ads for a day or you could spend 40 million dollars on Kate Upton you know? <laughs> yeah. it's not anything that I've got a budget for um, Trying to think about what I was the other part of the other answer for um, development um, process, the pipeline, getting bored with stuff. Oh, you were asking about um, what stuff wouldn't I want? Wouldn't I want to do? Um, oh, so what I was gonna say is like, so certain things are quite interesting. Like, if I have a rock in in Vector, just Mars rocks, I actually think it's quite soothing to make those, just based on the workflow. Because like a rock, you put chuck it in ZBrush with these displacement maps, and you're just like zoop zoop zoop, and it's a rock. Like it takes no time at all to build organic stuff. Like I can build a whole set of rocks for an entire track in like four hours, you know, from max model straight mm -hmm. into the game. It just takes, it takes no time at all. But then if you have something like a skimmer, which is technical and it's, you know, angles and it's, you know, you have the wires and rivets and stuff, it takes a lot of time and that's, you, you know, it's gonna take a lot of time. So you kind of hit a little bit of a motivational wall there. Um, so yeah, it just depends. You were saying about your track uh, design tools with Photoshop. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, so, okay, the terrains, are, I think they're really cool. Um, so, the first terrain I, I, I had, there's um, a map in there that's been there since the beginning. That's Lana's Run that you, you've all seen. It's been in every trailer. And that was actually based off of a, um, a height map I got off of Google of a place in Colorado. So it's got the plateaus, and those are, those are all natural, but then there's act, there was actually a displacement of roads and buildings in there. And from a, from a height map, that's gonna be a little square. So I had to go in there and I had to polish down the squares where the buildings were and polish down the roads. Um, but that just wasn't gonna cut it because you had to keep finding these high res displace maps. Uh, tried going on Mars, I've got some contacts in NASA because I actually used to work for NASA on the Hubble. Oh, wow. And yeah. um, I've been talking to this guy and, and uh, they're, that their focus now has shifted from Hubble into um, Mars, an actual Mars colonization. It's a real thing that's going to be happening probably within our lifetimes, yes. which is why it's so awesome. So I was like, hey, dude, I know you've got some topographical maps for me. <laughs> it's like, could you send those my way? And he's like, oh, sure. And just a year down the line, nothing happened. You're know, like, hey, how about those topo maps? So, you know, <laughs> he was pretty unreliable, unfortunately. Um, but what I ended up doing is I got this uh, plugin for Photoshop called Filter Forge, 
and oh, yeah. completely blew my mind. I, I worked with it a little bit. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, like procedural textures with yeah, no paste. Yeah, I, it's kind of like a shader. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it is in a way. And like, um, I I've never seen anything like that before. It's always been on my mind. Like, like, how do they make these ridiculous designs? And you don't realize that they're these procedural tools that you can tweak, and you just hit go, and it's just like whoosh, whoosh, shazam, you know. And it's just like whatever you want to do. And so I got really into that, and I started setting up all the, the procedural nodes. And the way I have it now is that for every track I have, I have a macro uh, filter in Filter Forge. And what I do is I have um, just a white template. Let's say if it's going to be a long map, we'll do you know, 40, 96 by 2048. And what I'll do is I'll be like, uh, I'll take the brush, and I'll just be like squiggle, and that'll be the track, depending on how I want to do it. Like maybe I'll say straight away, then a chicane, then a curve, you know, or just whatever I want the track to be. Chuck it in this. And I can say, well, I want 50% dunes, I want, you know, 20% um, plateaus and uh, 30% uh, cracks and gullies, you know, you just all the different settings and you just hit go and it just goes, boosh. Yeah. two hours later, boosh. it's there in process, is it? Um, but then it just, the, the work is done for you. You, you, know, you spend about a week getting that filter just right so mm -hmm. that everything's balanced and looks right. But then once it's ready, I can basically just take um, a texture, um, just draw a line and produce a new map and put it in the game in four hours. Mm -hmm. So once those macros are done, I can just keep stamping out new levels of any design that I want. And then the plateaus are there, the, the diffuse map is there, there's a, a ambient occlusion baked into the diffuse is done. Um, uh, some of the um, the maps you've seen, like the Tenarius, which is that really ruddy orange one, there, I haven't added any models aside from the cave um, in that. That's just all pure, straight out of Filter Forge. Awesome. So it's it's a pipeline that's just saved me heaps of time. And I know that in the full game, I could probably have like a hundred maps if I wanted to, based on those filters um, that I've made in Filter Forge. But I probably won't do that because it'll dilute the. You know, if you have a hundred maps of tracks, it'll kind of dilute the um, the the feeling of knowing a particular track. You know, yeah. so probably ten in the end. Would you have something like an open, like an open world, sort of tiles of connected maps that you can just mm. uh, explore on the schema, sort of thing? I would, I would love to. A lot of people have asked for that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm tempted to make a mod for Google um, Earth. <laughs> Because you know you can go on Mars there, you can travel on it. But I'd love to put a skimmer with physics on Google Earth and cruise around and just let it populate with real imagery. Um, the problem with that, when you do that tiling stuff, is you got to do what? Not not Dungeon Siege. There was um, a game a while ago that uh, tackled that problem of the you know the floating point accuracy and. Yeah, the further you get away from origin, the crazier things get. Yeah, well, Minecraft was one of them. Yeah. The faraway lands. Yeah. yeah. But so I guess Minecraft does the same thing, where your character's always the origin and the world kind of moves around you. Mm. I think that's how they tackle it, so that your sure. your accuracy is always there and everything moves, the terrain moves relative to where you are. There is something like that in Space Engineers. Mm. Yeah, that's what a lot of games use, but I haven't used it in Vector... Because the idea was to make tracks. And if I'm going to do tracks, then you're, it's obviously not open world, so I don't need to go to that kind of detail of making this um, origin shifting engine mm -hmm. dynamic. And I can just leave it the way it is. Um, but it would really complicate things, like for, for upcoming multiplayer and just all sorts of things, if yeah. the world moved around you. And it just adds a layer of complexity that I don't think I need at the moment. But um, yeah, down the line, I might change it up to that. Get a whole house of programmers working on it, sure. Mm -hmm. How have you found Unity for development? Good. I think Unity's awesome. Um, I dare say I'm a fanboy, but the reason I chose Unity is at the time, this was, I guess it was around 2011, 2012, you had a choice between going Unity or Unreal. Yeah. And for an Unreal license was like a million and a half dollars or something like that, which I didn't have at the time. Um, and then a full license for Unity was a hundred bucks a month. So I've been on a subscription ever since. And right. that native 3D Studio Max um, uh, 
usage is brilliant because I use 3Studio Max. Just yeah. put the file there and it yeah. just pops up. <laughs> just love it. Um, I thought the JavaScript and the uh, C Sharp was accessible because that's what I had done with the Google app I had made. Um, there's a couple little things about Unity that really um, uh, could be changed. But other than that, I love the engine. Awesome. Yeah. You said you've requested some changes. Mm. Well, it wasn't changes. It was, there are bugs that probably nobody cared about but me. But I think that they've, they've helped. One of the examples is when 5 rolled out, there was um, the global, uh, they introduced the global elimination. And with my game, I had a real-time daylight system. So at the beginning of every track, it would do the global illumination, and then just the sun would just sit there. So there shouldn't be any more calculations. And so when you're racing the ships across the surface, it would just really bog down. You go to the profile, and it's like global illumination, global illumination. And I did a lot of searching to try to figure out what what was changing my scene, and what was happening was all the lights in the game. I uh, if you had the bounce in the lights set to one then that's a component of global illumination. So it'll recalculate based on the bounce level. But if you set the bounce at zero, it means there's no bounce. It's just a regular old pixel light and it should be completely ignored. But since they just released it, I guess it was, it was a bug um, where even if you had the bounce at zero, it would still put it into the global illumination solution. Right. And it would calculate based on nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I kept hammering the, the forums and I was like, this is a problem. It slowed my game down. Oh, and what I had found out is that when I was in the game, I turn off global illumination, and the, the solution was still there. It looked great, but then I get 60 frames a second. I turn it back on again, back down to like 30. Mm -hmm. So I was like, if I turn GI off, I get a frame rate spike, and nothing in the scene is changing. What's going on with that? And then they they fixed it, and oh. um, I got an extra 30 frames a second out of it, and I think it's a better um, engine because of it. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think about? Unity. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it allows us to focus on the game design and mm. uh, what we want the game to be rather than building out the engine. And, mm. yeah. yeah, it let, lets me build the thing in a weekend or whatever. It's like game jams. And, yeah. Because I'm not a programmer or anything, but I still can like put, put a thing together. Mm. Um, yeah, there's and definite, really great. Yeah. definite restrictions, but I think the benefits outweigh the Mm. I kind of like the underdog as well. Yeah, like I'm always because I, I think underdogs are um, they're pushing harder. Mm. You know, it's just kind of like like indie guys. You know, it's like I think that there's like a, there's like a fire in the underdog and the indie guy to to compete with the AAA stuff and you know the Unreal has always had a really good position as um, a game engine and Unity's pushing really hard to catch up with them and they're doing a really good job so I appreciate that yeah the Unity's doing amazing now mm. like got articles coming out like Unity's the default indie tool now mm. and like backlash against it because it's been used so much yeah and like universities are using it now to yeah. teach game development so yeah they're doing something right mm. Did you guys ever consider Unreal when you were? Yeah. No, not really. Mm. Yeah, same because it's like licensing, mm. uh, and now that it's free, licensing is a revenue share. And it's like I'm not sure what the percentage is, but it's quite high. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's just not accessible, is it? Yeah. Mm. It's like after your after your platform holder takes a cut, then your DK takes a cut, then your publisher takes a cut. Yeah, and then, and then you're then, left with what? <laughs> Did you want to show us some vector? Sure. How does that work? Are you just going to screen capture the, yeah. the thing? So, the green light means it's recording. Is that through Steam or is that through something else? Uh, GeForce Experience. Cool. That's fine. That'll work, right? So, Maybe make that quiet. Yeah, so this is this is the game. It's uh, I guess I can call it in beta. It's been presented and it works and it plays. So um, there's two kind of major parts of the game. Um, I used to kind of think it was 
with you building and in, in custom uh, uh, skimmers versus actual racing. Uh, but I think it's leaning more towards 6040 now. I think I'm going to push it more towards the actual racing part and bring the customization a bit down because I think it intimidates a lot of people. Mm. Um, so uh, this is your skimmer and it's composed of uh, sort of support thrusters. You can see them coming out at the bottom here and that's what keeps it upright. And then you've got uh, a main thruster in the back which gives you your thrust. And these massive things are uh, the radiators because on Mars it has about like point O2 the atmosphere that Earth does. So if you're gonna cool off actively, you need massive radiators. Um, so, and everything is, uh respects the physics so if you ever decide to put it like on Venus you just have like a planetary modifier and everything will kind well, of equalize. What I want to do is so I mean like the gravity and yeah the atmosphere would be different so w the ultimate goal is have different skimmers made on different planets and they have different sort of attributes so if you're on Earth that you're gonna need a lot more power um, but a lot less cooling you know, because they have an actual atmosphere. So, because like, so, you need more power to lift the thing up than smaller radiators. So they'll just be different ships. They'll still have the same basic mechanics, but they'll be different. And then in the future, hopefully, I'll have kind of this rivalry going on. The original idea was to be kind of a I'm a big car guy to be kind of like domestic versus imports. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Hondas versus Holdens or whatever. So you have like the Earth skimmers, then you have like the Mars skimmers. And you're like, oh, Earth skimmers are junk. <laughs> Mars all the way. Like I would love to set up that sort of rivalry between the uh, between the planets um, and then you just swap parts as you go uh, I'll just give you. That, that kind of stuff is something that would actually uh, build communities around that sort of thing yeah I want that ire I want that <laughs> that anger uh, <laughs> that develops between Holden and Ford fans uh, so that's just the, the machine there so we go to edit mode uh, and this is a quick tutorial I'll skip it for the sake of brevity. Um, but you can go in here and we can swap out the cockpits based on the different ships you've got. Um, we'll go here into lift vectors and any, anywhere there's orange you can basically place it. So we'll take these and move those over there. And yeah, we can tilt these back and move in a little bit slowly because this is pads and change the angles and every angle that you change and it all offsets the weight and the whole characteristics like do you need a problem us uh, no i'll make two yeah. uh yeah so it's all based on um the positions of the thrust vectors and the the weight distribution of the ship so let me just do something a little more radical here just move things around I mean, you can you could technically, if you wanted to, you could put these way back here if you wanted, but then your, um, you know, weight distribution would be all off. You'd be butt heavy, and you'd be probably flying to the moon. So, you know, just whatever works, whatever fits, whatever looks cool. Um, and then once you're done with that, you can go inside the ship, and you've got your your mate, well, your gyro right here. And uh, you, know, you can reposition the gyro, the different torque settings for the gyros. Um, fuel is these sort of reactors on top, and you can replace those, and those will create actual area effects. There's not a whole lot of weapons in the game, but you can actually purge your um, fuel sources and convert it to a weapon. So in this case, sort of this fusion reactor, you can chuck one of those cores up in the air, and it'll be this kind of little bouncing sun, and if anybody hits it, just all hell breaks loose and everything. Everything explodes. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's a um, sort of a what I call the magna core reactor, and if you purge one of uh, the magna core, it will emit an EMP blast, like this blue ball that will just kill the electronics of any skimmer around you within like 50 meters. And it's great because you'll see all the skimmers just drop out of the air, and you know they'll at the last second their electronics turn back on, they'll kind of scramble and get back up again. Um, so all that changes the um, the weight distribution. So you move these around, and, you know, if it hits something, then it won't fit. So it's very much like modding your car. You know, you can you can try to get some bigger engines and smaller cars, um, but if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. 
I suppose I could add a um, welding and cutting. A, a hacksaw <laughs> option, yeah. <laughs> Start extending the chassis to fit more things. Um, I'm not going to save this one because I have no idea if it's going to fly well or not. Uh, otherwise, I have to reset the whole game. So we'll just go with this for now. I don't want to build some ship and have it not work right. Um, and as visualizers, you can see where all the thrusts are going in your center of gravity. You can override the gyro. And if you override the gyro, it'll start to list because it doesn't have that extra gyro support. But it, it's a good indication of if your ship is balanced or not. So you can yeah. see that's a little bit butt heavy. Um, and boost override, you can raise the boost and set it on fire if you so chose. Uh, so we'll do titanium. There it is. So once you've built your ship, chucks it on the grid and you're against the bots. This is kind of evening. Oh, does this work for this? Yep. There you go. Cool. No, 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 go. <laughs> so you've got to balance the bias. Do you want to talk about that? Or? Uh, yeah, so there's, I tried to break it. There's an EMP up front. There you go. Another purge. So he's a bit confused. <laughs> oh, he just lost a radiator. Yeah, so there's sort of basic functions, which is just left, right, you know, uh, yaw, pitch, boost, and uh, thrust. Um, but then there's advanced functions where you can redirect power to different systems. So if you see in the bottom left of my control, uh, the sort of display it says by 68%, I can bring that down to about 50%. And that means 50% uh, split between your lift and your thrust. And so if you're navigating something like this cave, you can kind of have, you'll be a little bit slower, but you won't bottom out. You can be a little bit um, safer. And I think that's what's kind of cool about Vector is you can actually go as fast as you want to. It's a little bit different from other racing games in that, in that respect. You can just crank up the bias to like 70 or 80 and go probably as fast as the fastest ships in the higher leagues but you will be scraping the ground because you won't have that bottom thrust. So I think it's a really great trade-off in terms of a game dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I think all games should be about that choice, that trade-off. It's like you can do this one thing and do exceptionally well in this one area at the expense of another. Yeah. That's a choice you make, and um, the repercussions are on you. So I'll crank it back up to 70 now. You've also got the boost, but you get... Temperature increase. Yeah, so you gotta modulate your um, your temp. So right now I got the boost on. Let it go a little bit. Easy. Um, so on the right, you can see that 100%. That's the throttle. Hold that down to 150%, and the temperature will start to rise because you're basically over boosting your your ship. Um, let's do a quick lap here. If you go to 90%, you'll actually start to overload some of the components. So you have to buy components that can handle that sort of power. Right. So that's very, you know, you don't really want to fly at 90%. It's just, it's just too fast for mortal, <laughs> mortal uh, controls. Oh, easy. Oh, no. Not pay attention here. <laughs> go back up to 630. So if you damage your craft, let's get in the sun here. Go ahead and smash it. Boink. Now you're on fire. You've lost your radiators. Your gyro's turned off. In pretty bad shape. Um, so the game's not over. Basically, you have these repair bots, and they come hurtling in, and they'll piece you back together again. So there he is. Um, they don't have a priority. Like, if you're on fire, I really want them to put your radiators on first. There's no priority <laughs> at the moment. They just grab whatever's nearest to them. Um, but yeah, I think if you're currently burning, it'd be really important to get you cooled off first, but uh, the bots don't seem to care. Maybe have a special 
there's firefighter bot. <laughs> yeah, well, that's coming up next. So, I'm gonna, so you'll have another choice. You can buy um, extinguisher bots, and they'll be the same bots with these massive tanks on the back, and they'll come in and just <laughs> and then fly away. Nice. And then I'll have um, aggressor bots, which are basically modified helper bots, where you can target another skimmer, and they'll go racing over and latch on and pull a part off of that skimmer. And he's mining for gold is what he's doing. <laughs> I should have two, actually. I don't know where he is. And so this is uh, when you're damaged, you can look down here, and you can see all the different things that are wrong with you. So gyro fault, radiator faults. So I'm missing my rear right, my main, and my rear left vectors. Um, where my other bot is, I don't know. I think I'm actually landing on top of them. Anyway, the bots need work. <laughs> <laughs> not a great ending to that, but yeah, the bots are supposed to put me together and not let me sit here like a moron. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, what is he doing? Sometimes <laughs> the parts will actually fall through the ground. Oh yeah. And I think what they try and do is they try and, they can't get through the ground obviously, so he's just on top of it trying to get down there. So, yeah, that's game dev um, issues. This game is still in development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's fantastic. Anyway. Sweet. That's that. Do we do another level, or what else do you want me to show? Yeah, sh show another level. I'll show um, one of the cities. Oh, and also show the, the shop with all the different um, skimmers you can get. Oops. It's okay. It takes a lot of time to make the assets. Like the terrain's quite easy, I think. Like I told you before, how it all just sort of pops up. But for each level, for each kind of macro level setting that I have, I want an asset pack that makes that level unique. Because otherwise, they all just looks like Mars, you know. So um, that last one's got the ice caves. That's sort of that theme is it's going to be this nice orange color with snow and then ice cave sections you can kind of go into. Um, this is a little bit different. This has got sort of a cityscape. Um, guys are hauling. See, you've got a jump button. And you also use that to cushion the landing, right? Yeah, so the bias, uh, you can redirect thrust up and down manually, but there's also a button called what I call a bias jump. And if you hold it down, it'll basically go full, full beans downward so you can jump over stuff or uh, cushion. So you're coming down quite hard, you can cushion it with that bias jump. So it's a pretty important tool. Microsoft advertising. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, so behind all the sand is that's Agonific City. And yeah, just I just got back from Microsoft Ignite um, conference. That's why it's full of Microsoft stuff. Don't judge me. <laughs> What's some kind of advanced tactics you're employing? What are some of the tactics? Yeah, yeah. For racing? Yeah. Get to the end fast? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like it's yeah, you just uh, it's a classic racing game. It's just get there before the other guy does. But you, I find like with Vector, you, at least I have to anticipate the corners more, and uh, I don't know. 
Just like in actual racing. <laughs> yeah, but this is like drifting, but extreme. It depends on your ship. Um, oh. Some ships are actually more drifty than others. Um, that's actually a pretty good race. Um, yeah, it just depends. It depends on your, your style as well. Um, I want to make it so that you can build a... Uh, skimmer kind of the way that you want to and if you want to build a skimmer that just ICBMs from one gate to the other just like straight just rockets there and just lands and just goes boof and gets up and does it again fine go <laughs> for it um, I've seen a couple skimmers like that and they're pretty awesome nice. but if you're more of or if you're more of like you know straight line kind of guy not into the drifting um, there's different chassis you can get that are kind of push it more in that direction instead of doing these wide sweeps I quite like the drifting aspect of it um, but because it's all physics based, that's just sort of what the inherent, uh, gameplay dynamic is. It's just this floaty, drifty feel. So this is the store. Um, right now it's all just sort of, um, within the game. It's all local. Eventually it'll go onto the, onto the web and I want players to be able to craft their own skimmers and sell them to each other. I want entire E, um, garages of just people producing skimmers and, you know, put their own stamp on it and be known as like a really good tuner or not. So I want these sort of virtual skimmer tuners on online that people can um, kind of buy from. Nice. I might take a, a little bit of a cut of it. <laughs> uh, so these are the manufacturer's skimmers. That's the GK. That's kind of the F1 of skimmers. It's the quill. Um, and sort of upper range, there's a hopper. It's just kind of the, the Mario of skimmers. It's just always in all, in all the, the artwork. Cause I want like kind of, I need to have like kind of an icon. And if I keep showing that as the quintessential skimmer, I think it will help it. I don't know yet. Like I thought about dancing between different images of different skimmers, but I think if I just keep the same one, people will recognize it. And then over here are some of the custom ones. So if you don't want to build a skimmer on your own, um, you can actually just pop into the store and you'll have a collection of different custom skimmers. Uh, and I'm thinking about updating these probably like weekly. And you, know, you can pop in the store and just find some new ones that I've crafted up, which I think would be quite cool. I encourage people to go into the store and see what's new. Nice. And I'll be releasing more ships, more parts, accessories, um, all that kind of stuff over, over time. Um, more tracks, all that's going to be free. So you, you'll you have the game, uh, you'll buy it once, and all the content for that game will be free after that in terms of um, parts and ships and, and skimmers. And that way also when you're on multiplayer, if new stuff comes out, everyone will have that. You don't have to buy DLC. Like It annoys me when one friend has DLC and the other one doesn't, and then they can't play together. So yeah, just everybody owns everything. And so here's the store. And this is... There's some diverters, you've got some radiators, um, reactors, gyros. What's that? Cube. The cube. What is it? What is what the national cube. These? Yeah. What are they called? Um, hypercube? No, not the hypercube. It's um, the name for something. It's like the mathematical inverse of a cube. It's um, Tesseract. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, those are the ECUs. They're kind of like suspended in the little box to, for shock protection. And the ECUs are really funny because that's in each, the, the way that I've designed it is that each of these parts has the code in the actual part. And I, I treat it the same way I would like if it was real life. You know, it's like you put that component, that class in the actual part. So when you switch between the cubes, you're actually loading a whole new class of um, code in the actual object itself. And so when the cube breaks, it actually cuts the code off and it's like done. Or not, not exactly, but it will act appropriately. And so in each of those ECUs is the whole control scheme for the game. And I only got two because controls are kind of a tricky subject, you know, trying to figure out what people are into. And they're so complicated as to what thrusts do what and what can, you know, how, the ship moves, that had to keep it quite simple. And so I've got two different versions for two different setups. 
I want to eventually keep releasing new ECU schemes for different things. So if at some point you want to create like a UFO where it just spun around and spun its way down to the, um, to the next gate, you could, but I'd have to come up with the code for it. Um, and the ultimate goal is to have a completely custom ECU. I was thinking of doing a, an ECU all in like XML or something where you could basically type up yourself and read the XML file and then you could fly your skimmer based on your own the same way as with like the open source quadcopter stuff. I think that'd be awesome. It's mm. definitely for purists. Sounds like a tricky thing to balance. Yeah. Well, it's just, it'd be just there for people who really wanted to have total control. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Uh, you sell, you can trade um, all the skimmers, but that's, that's the store. Nice. Yeah. And you're showing the game at PAX yep. uh, in Melbourne later this year? Yeah, I'll be at PAX. I'll be in the international indie booth next to the ANZ guys, next to the cafe. So when you want to get a snack, you can play my game. <laughs> Primo real estate. Yes. There's, the, there's my guy. Uh, oh, I guess I can just quickly talk about the things you will actually pay for. So I said all the content is free, which is true. There's, there's nothing in the game that someone can have over you that will benefit them. You know, all the parts will be the same, but I will be charging probably real money for things like different uniforms, different helmets, you know, sort of customization stuff. Paint schemes will probably be a paid sort of a thing just to make yours a little bit more unique. And also on the right, you see um, garage slots four. So you can actually buy more or less slots. So the first game, I think we'll have two garage slots. And uh, for I think around five dollars, you can upgrade that to four. Another five dollars will duplicate that to eight. Another five dollars go to sixteen slots. But every time you buy um, a new garage, the whole setting changes. So the first one you're going to get, which is uh, and I'm working on this now, is it's basically out in the middle of nowhere. You have like your tent and your skimmer and like your toolbox, and that's your first garage, and it's just two slots. And so this would be the upgrade to that. You pay five bucks, you get the actual hangar and workshop. Um, after this, you move up into a really fancy, like have you ever seen um, uh, Bugatti's workshop? Um, oh, yeah. It's all like <laughs> tiles and like pristine. pristine, like it's just, yeah, it just gets nicer and nicer and you've got more slots. We're talking about having like um, as the top, the top one would be kind of this like space station. You'd have the ships on kind of like these sort of like pods that would just shuffle over and it would just eject you out down to, to Mars. So nice. that's kind of cool. Are you going to be able to earn those through in-game currency as well? Mm -mm. Well, I don't think so. Uh, and the reason for that is because if the game is a set price and um, you really like the game, I think you'll be encouraged to pay that five dollars for more for more um, slots. But if you if, if the game is not your sort of thing, then you know it's it's a it's a fair price, and you don't have to upgrade. But you're also not losing anything. You know, two skimmers might be fine for you. Um, I guess down the line I could I could actually have it to be um, in game currency. You'd have to you'd have to really um, just see what works. Yeah. See, see what the feedback of the community is. Yeah. yeah. They can't keep getting everything for free. No. So. No, I gotta have some way to to upgrade in the future, um, just money wise. Uh, and I'll have ads and stuff which. Um, the billboards, like you saw the Windows stuff in the future, I think that will all be paid advertising space that um, other companies or um, other games can um, buy into if they want. And I think that'll work because it actually brightens up the level. It makes it a little bit more authentic, um, but it's also real ads. You know, I think it's a, a pretty good way to bring in some extra revenue. Sweet. Yeah. That is that vector for you. Awesome. So when is uh, when is it coming out? Mm. Um, I hope end of November. I think oh we'll, we'll do packs. We'll see what the feed what the people say, and if um, if it's a largely positive response, we can probably look at uh, early access in November. But if it's unanimously panned, might need to go on the back burner for a bit. <laughs> might need a little bit more work. Mm. And there's no pressure to release, like you can still fund yourself and develop for 
for a while? Or um, is there a cutoff point where it's like, no, like March and that's it, we can't go on? <laughs> that's, yeah, end of November is kind of the cutoff point. Um, I would have to find new ways to fund the game. Hmm. Yeah. You don't want that ship, do you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. To me, this is the, the vector ship. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I played it last year. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's it's just always been on the imagery and it's always been there. Um, and I think it's got a unique design. Uh, so I don't mind it being sort of the, the poster boy for the game. Yeah, many games do that. Like on the cover you get, you know, Skyrim has, has the helmet. It's yeah. like the iconic helmet, but it's the worst item in the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. just like the first things you get is the default kind of starter kit yeah and this is it's it's a mid-range ship it's by no means the best um but it's just been there the longest it's got tenure <laughs> he almost lost a radio there yeah and so the the big crawly things on the right those are terraformers and they're just constantly pumping oxygen out to the surface of um mars and you're kind of in the middle of this transition stage where you've got the settlers that have come down to Mars, then you have this company that was brought onto Mars to terraform it. And uh, sort of the backstory is that because this company has control of the air supply, they're the only ones producing air, they can kind of turn the terraformers on or off. And you can see the communities right there that are building up around the, the base of them. And uh, there's a bit of a, a dodgy story underneath um, kind of in regards to um, business, uh, big business ethics, you know, it's like you have this responsibility to take care of people or, you know, you're producing oxygen as maybe as a contractor, but at the same time, you have a bit of a responsibility to, um, not turn it off and kill them. But there's a little bit of a drama between the settlers, the original settlers of Mars and then this, uh, this new company, GK. thing 100 that's all right it's okay <laughs> yeah. all right yeah i think we'll wrap up cool thanks for having me yeah thanks for coming out yeah. and we'll put all the things and links and check it out at pax yeah if you <laughs> no, no, don't do that <laughs> yeah uh November, what is it? November, October 29th? 28th, to November. 29th to uh, the 2nd of November, I think. Uh, yeah. We'll be at PAX there as well. So, cool. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in Melbourne. See you there. Sweet.